Hello again. I've mentioned before the advantages which sometimes come from the crossing of different species, which is surprisingly common, by the way, in the natural world. Roughly 10% of species um, interbreed from time to time. Sometimes it's done deliberately by people, as with the creation of mules by co crossing horses and donkeys. Mules are stronger, have more stamina, need less food, and are more intelligent than either horses or donkeys. Charles Darwin remarked upon this, by the way. About 40,000 years ago, two human species mated together with momentous consequences for the subsequent history of the world. In this case, too, the result might have been to give the crossbreeds a new hybrid vigour. About 40 or 50,000 years ago, Europe and Western Asia were occupied by the Neanderthals. They were not the brutish, subhuman creatures which we sometimes uh, see them as. Indeed, in many ways, they had the edge over the modern humans who were to leave Africa shortly. Before Homo sapiens even left Africa, the Neanderthals were making cave paintings, decorating themselves with necklaces, and even building strange rings from broken stalagmites and stalactites inside caves. Um, the structures of this kind that were made are the oldest things ever built by any human. Um, they were built about 120,000 years before any modern humans did anything similar. Not only that, but the Neanderthals were making things like string and glue, which were not seen in Africa at that time. In short, when the first modern humans turned up in the Middle East, it was not the case that a superior species were about to appear who would beat the Neanderthals with sheer brain power. Indeed, there's no reason at all to suppose that Homo sapiens were any more intelligent than the Neanderthals. Almost the first thing that modern humans did when they arrived was to start mating with Neanderthals, and this was, as you might say, the making of them. The newcomers acquired some pretty useful genes from those who had been living in that area for many thousands of years. Some of these genes were to do with the immune system. Um, it was quite handy for the modern humans arriving to acquire genes which would protect them from pathogens, germs, you know, bacteria and viruses, uh, which were prevalent in Europe and the Middle East and against which they had no protection. This particular gene was a mixed blessing because it now causes hay fever and other allergies. That happens when our body treats something as though it's an intruder, say pollen or dust, and starts overreacting and uh, stimulating the immune system. Perhaps the most important gene which the Neanderthals had and modern humans did not was a version of a gene called MCPH1 or microcephalin. Apes have a version of this gene, but the human ones are very different. Uh, microcephalin helps our brain to grow to the right size. If the gene is damaged or absent, then the brain and skull do not grow to the proper size, and you end up with a condition known as microcephaly. That means you have a very small skull. Uh, they used to call people like that pinheads at one time, rather unkindly. Some versions of the microcephaly gene are different from others. Since many humans only acquired this version of the gene uh, 37,000 years ago, it's a fair guess that it has somehow been taken from the Neanderthals. Now comes the interesting part. People in Africa who have no European ancestry do not have any Neanderthal DNA. They are, of course, the same species as everybody else, but they're missing those 2 or 3% of DNA which everybody else picked up on the way out of Africa. Does this make any difference? This is a very debatable point. One particular variety of microcephalin is very common in Asia, Asia common in Europe, and not at all common in sub-Saharan Africa. 
This discovery was made a little over 15 years ago and was promptly denounced as racism because it seemed to suggest that there might be fundamental differences in the brains of different ethnicities. Things then got very complicated because IQ tests didn't seem to indicate that those with this version of microcephaly, microcephaly gene were any more intelligent than those who lacked it. A lot of tests were conducted, but these, there just didn't seem to be a correlation between this uh, microcephaly gene and basic IQ. People began wondering if perhaps its only function was to stop microcephaly developing. This may be part of the story, but it's probably not the whole thing. In America, the usual rate of microcephaly in babies is, is about three or four per hundred thousand births. The rate for African Americans is twice that, so it's possible that that's accounted for by the absence of this particular version of the microcephaly gene. It doesn't seem to be very likely that that's all that it explains though, because once modern humans acquired that gene, all those thousands of years ago, it spread very quickly and it's still with us. It must serve some useful purpose. It was left to some exceedingly dubious and unethical experiments in China a few years ago to indicate the true importance of the gene. It's long been observed that people from East Asia tend to have higher IQs than those from Europe. Asians, whether coincidentally or not, also have a far higher incidence of the particular version of the microcephaly gene which we've been talking about. Some Chinese researchers decided to insert the gene into monkeys and see what would happen. The Chinese had done stuff like this before. There are persistent rumours that during the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s, a human-chimpanzee hybrid was produced in China. At any rate, the microcephaly gene was inserted into a virus and then transferred to some monkey embryos. This all sounds a bit like the uh, Planet of the Apes film, I know. When these monkeys grew up, it was hoped that their brains would be bigger than average, although that didn't happen. What was found, though, was that the monkeys were able to process information faster and they did better on memory tests. This suggests that the version of the microcephaly gene, which is so common in China and so rare in sub-Saharan Africa, certainly has something to do with... Uh, intelligence or cognition, although exactly what, isn't quite clear. That the particular version of this gene seems to follow the gradient for IQ levels in different populations is intriguing, but not of course conclusive. On the face of it, it looks as though modern humans received a boost from Neanderthal DNA 40,000 years ago, and that this helped with intelligence. If so, then those Homo sapiens who did not make the journey out of Africa missed out on this extra ingredient, causing measurable effects. It need hardly be said that this whole subject is hugely controversial, not so much because the research itself is faulty or unethical, although some of it is, but rather because the implications are so unpalatable to many people, both scientists and the laity. It would be confirmation of an inherent advantage in intellectual ability which Asians and Europeans enjoy over those from sub-Saharan Africa and would as such touch at the very foundations of the modern equalitarian doctrine which holds that there are no inherent biological differences between ethnic groups but that anything we see is really a matter of cultural difference. Other work on the genetic basis for intelligence has been carried out in just the same way and criticised too, not because it has been badly done, but rather because it's been done at all. Ideology in this case trumps science and some subjects are seen as too dangerous to delve into too deeply. That's always a bad sign when ideology tells us what science should and should not be looking at. I'll give a couple of links in the description to this video. None of this is certain. This is all what you might describe as cutting-edge research, but the idea itself is an 
interesting one and some people are determined to pursue it further.